this is a, a difficult health condition because of what it takes from you. In the throes of addiction, it can take your family, it can take your job, it can take your house, it can take your whole support system and leave a person in a desperate situation. People want to be part of a community and want to find their way back in. Well, how do you find your way back into to the community if all the doors are shut? I think the thing that everybody could learn from the recovery community, we may have difference of opinions or we may have a different taste or whatever, but at the end of the day, our common purpose is to help each other get better. This story both explains and explores the world of harm reduction in North Carolina, a world filled with unassuming heroes and unsung heroics. God knew where he wanted me and what he wanted me there for. That boy didn't, he wasn't his time. A world where something as simple as choosing words more carefully can change lives. That's a tangible thing that people can do because some of the harm and some of the, the shame and stigma and isolation that I see that, that I think is deadly. If you're wondering what harm reduction is, odds are you do it every day. Driving a car can be a risky behavior, but we wear a seatbelt and we obey traffic laws, and that's harm reduction. We go to the beach and we risk getting sunburned, so we put on sunscreen. We don't want to get food poisoning, so we check the expiration dates on the food in our refrigerator and in our cabinets. We trust our neighbors for the most part. We live next to them every day, right? We still lock our doors at night, right? Because that's harm reduction. For many of us, harm reduction is simply reducing risk in our everyday lives. But for those who work in the field of harm reduction, it's about specifically reducing risk surrounding substance use. Actually, the term harm reduction was new to me when I first heard of it working in North Carolina. And after a while, I realized, oh, it's just a different term for what we do in public health. It's reducing harm to people's lives. It's supporting people. It's meeting people exactly where they are at. It's not an abstinence-based approach. It's just a lessening of harm to you, the person that's using, and the community. And to me, I mean, it comes down to, to life saving. It's, it's, about, it's about saving lives. It's about preserving human dignity. I think harm reduction for me is a public health strategy to keep people alive until they can seek treatment for their addiction. It, it is a lot of that, but it's also compassion for yourself and finding compassion in other people. It's all for willing to hear someone's story, even though it's not something that you may have experienced or identified with, but accepting that's part of the journey. It's important that um, everyone, each and every one of us, um, has a sense of purpose, belonging, and access to a life that's worth living. You know, it's like a guy standing on the beach and sees someone out in the water drowning. You know, as public health, we don't stand on the beach and go, well, you got yourself into that situation, get yourself out of it. If I go out there and I rescue you, you're just going to go back out there again. No, we just go out there, we meet them where they are, we bring them to shore, we provide rescue, and we try to set the stage so they don't repeat that problem again. What we have to do as a society is understand this may not be in your, in your household right now. But if you don't become a part of the movement, it could be in your backyard tomorrow. <laughs> it, could be, it could be your granddaughter next week. Uh, it, it does not discriminate. Most of this story will take place where most of the work happens, out in small pockets of the state where advocates have settled down and started up small organizations that are saving lives every day. But our story starts with a view from the top and a public health advocate named Alan Delapena. You know, harm reduction isn't an abstinence-based approach. There's still people within use. And we want people to get to a healthy recovery stage. But maybe, maybe only 20% of them are, you know, for folks who are in a substance use disorder, maybe only 20% are ready for an abstinence. What do we do about the 80%? Alan recently retired from the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services. 
He's been in public health for decades, shaping policy both nationally and here in North Carolina. He spearheaded a statewide group called OPDAC, the Opioid and Prescription Drug Abuse Advisory Committee. They coordinate work between the state and nonprofits in the field. There are things that we can do that a nonprofit can't do, and there are things that nonprofits can do that we can't do. And we try to, you know, kind of meet in the middle. I have learned working with the harm reduction folks that not everybody who's experiencing substance use disorder is going to walk into a state agency building and say, I need your help. Alan, like many of the people you're about to meet, believes that at the end of the day, harm reduction is about humanity. We don't want a person to die because of their health condition. And I think for me, one of the first pathways in that I really learned about harm reduction and the opioid epidemic was naloxone. Naloxone is a, is a medication that can reverse an overdose. We've begun to equate naloxone to like an AED defibrillator for a heart attack. You know, we have an AED defibrillator now basically on every floor of every public building and it's saving people from heart attacks every day. It just gives them a chance to live another day. It doesn't uh, address the underlying conditions that led them to the heart attack. It's not preventing the ongoing conditions. It's just allowing a life to be saved. You're reducing the harm. The other thing critical to seeing harm reduction for what it is, is seeing substance use disorder for what it is is a chronic health condition and lots of people live with chronic health conditions uh, whether it be diabetes or cancer or heart disease and they can live long stable productive lives and we have seen so many great success stories of people with substance use disorder that can follow the same path and maybe they have a cycle of, re of recurrence and recovery but the recovery is the important part of the story that they can live and continue their life that is both the point and the purpose. And as you'll see, that kind of support at the state level has been critical in moving harm reduction from the shadows to whatever screen you're watching this on right now. In North Carolina, folks have a way to figure out how to collaborate with each other, it, it, whether it's in their community, whether it's the county commissioners, the law enforcement community, the General Assembly, uh, the executive branch of the government, the state agencies. We found our common ground to work together. I know you're meeting with a lot of folks to put this piece together and I, I think you're going to meet some amazing people and they're amazing because they're getting to do what they love and they're helping people and they're making progress. On the road to understanding harm reduction, you'll find inspiring off-ramps all over the state. But there's one group you'll find in towns from the mountains to the coast, the North Carolina Harm Reduction Coalition. NCHRC. They've got offices across the state and a network of outreach programs to get to people who can't always get to them. Probably need socks. At the NCHRC office in Wilmington, North Carolina, Becca Rose and Vonnie Goodson Simpson are sorting through basic life supplies. So just wondering if I should tap into maybe one of the thrift stores to see if they Becca, want to on the left, started the operation. Vonnie is the case manager here. We have a bunch of good information like our hours, our outreach phone number, the Never Use Alone number, which is a 24-hour hotline. This NCHRC office opened about five years ago, and Becca has been at the helm ever since. Over here we have our fentanyl positive board. These are um, like the names of the uh, drugs that are going around. NCHRC offices are all unique in different ways to best meet the needs of their local communities, but they have a consistent MO. Here is a board of basically everything that we give out. Offering participants much of the same stock and supplies and always meeting the same mission, helping reduce harm for folks who could use a hand. We do free HIV and Hep C testing. Stop in at just about any NCHRC office and you will find basic life supplies for all ages and stages. Everything from food, clothes and diapers to tools for safer sex like condoms and supplies to help people who are continuing to use drugs do it more safely such as sterile water, tourniquets and alcohol pads. NCHRC offices are also places people can exchange and dispose of used syringes, no stigma attached. Each of these holds 120 syringes, used syringes, 
And so our participants will take a biohazard container and they will put their used ones in the biohazard container and bring it back to us. That way it doesn't end up in the trash can, it doesn't end up in any parks or anything like that. People are very, very scared of the term syringe exchange. I think a lot of times people think I am like sitting in a dark room with needles and I'm just throwing needles out. This is to prevent communicable diseases like HIV and hepatitis C. That is what syringe exchange baseline is to do. So instead of, you know, finding syringes on the ground that are not sterile and sharing syringes, um, com communicating like hepatitis C to other people or, or HIV to other people, that spreads in our community. It's community care, right? So it's not only what folks find at NCHRC offices that can be life-saving, it's who. The staff is just as important as the stuff. Syringe exchange is a first point of contact that basically plants a seed to peer support, to care, to um, reduce harm on people so they don't have communicable diseases, so they don't have to, um, you know, treat their own abscesses at home because of stigma. They can come here and I also do wound cares here as well. When they do come in, at some point, they may find themselves ready to start walking toward recovery. When that happens, they meet Becca's partner, Bonnie Goodson Simpson, NCHRC's Linkage to Care Manager. There are a lot of barriers that one could have. So um, whatever their pre presentation is, um, we kind of sort of work through that, just meeting them where they are. Vani has been working with marginalized populations and people showered in stigma for decades. Here, she's a navigator, an advocate, and a friend. Whenever you come in, we ask you, how can we help? What do you need today? And so it starts a basic conversation, and in that conversation comes information. So um, I need some safer use supplies, but I also have a problem with this on my arm. And so Becca may take a look at it and say, okay, well, this looks like it needs some attention. Can we have you, do you mind going next door or having the linkage to care manager come over and take a look? So then we'll ask, can you come over and sit and are you well, ready to deal or address this need on today? And if so, let me make some community referrals. Part of the work here involves saving lives in the literal sense. This is one place people can access and learn about the life-saving drug naloxone, often called Narcan, free of charge and free of stigma. I go around and I teach people how to administer naloxone in an overdose emergency. But they don't just train people on naloxone, occasionally they administer it. They have the medication here, of course, a just-in-case that, so far, has saved nine lives on site. It's usually one person and another person or a group of people. Somebody's overdosing and if they're passing by here and they need Narcan, they are out of it, they will come and pull up and they'll come in and say, hey, I need, I need help with an overdose reversal. So I get my kits, I come out, I, get, I have a rescue um, breathing mask and um, I just start to administer naloxone and do all of the steps to bring that person back. I always ask them too, I'm like, so th they survived? And they're like, yep, they survived, they're doing well. Um, we stayed with them all night. We did exactly as you have trained us to do um, to administer the naloxone. So just providing that drug user education to these people, that is keeping people alive um, out there while they're going through it. Halfway across the state from the Wilmington HRC office, Another harm reduction effort has been growing in Hickory, North Carolina, just north of Charlotte. This one rooted in faith. And for many in the field, faith is at the very heart of it. Jesus met people where they were. As a ministry, we say our faith is our why, but it's not our what. So we don't evangelize. Michelle Mathis and Karen Lowe have carved out a refuge for folks struggling with substance use. All in a little tiny house of love and hope. Olive Branch Ministry. This is not only our vision, this is a community's vision. One thing that we know from the life um, and love of Jesus is that he always addressed physical needs before he addressed the spiritual when he came across, across people that were hurting. And so that's what we try to do. We plant seeds, but then we realize that we may not be the one that ever see those seeds 
grow up and come to harvest. We're simply here to plant the seeds of hope and love. But if their mission is heaven sent, Karen and Michelle are doing the work on unapologetically human terms. Being in um, traditional church, we also realized that there was a need that was being missed. We provide things like jail-based education. So we go into the jail and we provide information about um, opioid tolerance drop, about opioid overdose, about how to reverse an overdose, and then things like wellness recovery action plans, which teaches people what their triggers may be, how to recognize those, and how to stay in safe space, and how to ask for help if they get into a place where they know they're gonna go into crisis. We provide anti-stigma training for law enforcement, for public health, social services, and the faith community. We provide linkage to care for our program participants, which simply means that we may not provide a certain clinical service, but we make sure that our folks aren't just given a referral and a piece of paper and sent away. We provide syringe access, which again, reduces the spread of HIV and Hep C. And along those lines, we do HIV and Hep C testing, we do free Hep C treatment, and we also provide low barrier Suboxone, which is a way that people can come off of street drugs and slowly begin to use another medication to help address their substance use disorder. Today, we're gonna to meet two individuals. One, his name is Gary. When I met Gary, he was um, actively using yeah, with his substance use disorder. Quite frankly, he died um, at least once from an overdose and was brought back by Narcan that our organization was able to supply to his family. My wife um, gave me Narcan and gave me CPR for 45 minutes until the ambulances got there and stuff. My daughter saw it and she walked in in the middle of it with my wife on top of me, you know, slapping me, trying to wake me up. She was. Uh, almost 10 at the time. She was at church and she come home and the next day I was at the clinic and at the methadone clinic. Without Michelle and, and Karen and, and my wife I, I would be dead because the Narcan that she gave me was I got from them. Gary has been able to change his housing situation. He's regained custody of his daughter. He has a great relationship um, with his family. He has steady employment and he's been able to tap into some creativity that he hadn't had the ability to do in a long time. Jessica, similar story. She has custody of her son. She has steady employment. Um, she's living in a house now, and um, she's made a lot of positive changes in her life. I started using drugs when I was 13. I'm 34 now. Um, I really didn't have a bad life. I just made bad choices. When I met Jessica, um, she was beginning the period of, of abstinence, but that was because she was behind bars. She was incarcerated. I got out, I volunteered for her, and then a job opportunity came available. I took classes and I became a, port, a peer support specialist and got the job. What's that mean? What do you do? Um, I, I give people hope. They understand me and my story and they can relate on it. We uh, proudly wear the moniker of hope dealers. It doesn't have to be black and white you're using or you're not using. There's this huge gray area, and I truly believe Jesus meets us in the gray, and so we meet our folks in the gray too. As long as they want to stay there, we're there with them. And can I get some fentanyl test strips? And if you'll give me a pack of water. Drive another hour northeast from Hickory, and you'll find yourself rolling into Winston-Salem, North Carolina, where on this day, like most, Colin Miller and Rachel Thornley are packing up their mobile harm reduction unit. Colin runs the Twin City Harm Reduction Collective, and by this point in our story, you might sense a theme. Uh, we connect people to care, we connect people to all sorts of different, um, you know, various community resources like food pantries, clothes closets, kind of whatever anyone needs, but our focus is serving people who use drugs, people who are engaged in sex work. I do it because it's it's what I'm passionate about and it's what saved my life. I, I'm, I'm a person who uh, has struggled with IV drug use, heroin, cocaine, etc. Pretty much everything. Also was uh, you know engaged in sex work for a, a good long time when I was up in Minneapolis, which is where I'm from. 
and uh, there was a program up there called Access Works that was run by a group called Women with a Point. That was sort of like my safe haven where I could go talk to people that actually had a foot in the game or knew what the hell I was talking about and didn't treat me like I was, you know, some sort of, you know, monster. Okay, um, so you want to sign up with our program? I'm Rachel Thornley and I'm the program manager at Twin City Harm Reduction Collective. We're a fully operating syringe exchange, harm reduction organization. Um, we give out sterile supplies to IV drug users. Syringes, cookers, waters, tourniquets, we've got an array of supplies. We also do wound care supplies, um, feminine hygiene and other hygiene supplies. We also distribute um, warm clothes and tents and sleeping bags to the people who are experiencing um, homelessness in our community. And I do that off of the mobile unit as well. Let's say someone is, is using heroin intravenously, you know, and, you know, not using a, a, a sterile syringe every time, you know, we can coach them on, on safer injection techniques to avoid things like, you know, cellulitis and soft tissue infections and also HIV, Hep C, things like that. So these programs didn't exist where I grew up and where I did most of my drug use, all of my drug use. There was no access to sterile supplies, there was no access to Narcan, there was, I mean, we didn't even know about harm reduction, you know, and, um, I mean, it, it was bad. Oh, okay, cool, cool, cool. Colin and Rachel operate out of the church right next door. All right, we will be out there um, pretty, uh, I'm guessing within like the next hour or so. Where Sarah Howell Miller is one of the pastors. I am one of the pastors at Green Street United Methodist Church in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, and I'm on staff with the National Harm Reduction Coalition, uh, working with the Faith in Harm Reduction program. When I first heard about um, syringe distribution. This was a, an unfamiliar concept to me even just four or five years ago. You know, I had seen the harm that was secondary to drug use in the lives of people I really loved and I just couldn't imagine doing anything to support that use. Quickly came to understand that, you know, whether you give someone supplies or not actually does not make any difference of whether they're going to use drugs. What it makes a difference in is are they going to get an infection? Are they more likely to overdose? Are they likely to get some kind of disease that could, you know, ruin their lives and the lives of people around them? Sarah is also Colin's wife, and that puts her in the harm reduction business as well, which is right where she belongs. I was raised in, in a church that taught that if you weren't serving the people around you, you weren't really <laughs> living your faith. And so um, to me, it's always been really important. And it's, um, it's been nice to be able to partner with that some with Colin and, and learn from him about sort of the practical side of harm reduction and some of the policy stuff. And then, you know, try to figure out like, how, how does theology tie into this? How does this other stuff that I'm interested tie into this? My name is Stephanie Kim. A relative of mine almost died using dirty needles and water. She was in the hospital for three months before they got her stable enough to do the surgery to replace uh, a valve. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's hit really close to home. We keep Narcan on hand and we keep it pulled up and ready to go instead of having to fumble and pulling it up. Yeah. When it happens, we're ready. When they talk about life-saving services, yeah. these, yeah, are, these are these exactly. are life-saving. Exactly. Yeah. We have um, neighbors who have, uh, you know, requested to have naloxone that they can keep on hand. We've had neighbors who will let us know if they find a syringe that they're not comfortable picking up, so that we can come get it. And you know, it's um, it's just been neat to see a shift in awareness in the immediate neighborhood, and then I think much more broadly as well. Are you looking for the exchange? Yeah, you got it. Just down the road from the work being done in Winston-Salem is an example of how well it can go when all the parts are working together. It started a few years back at UNC Greensboro with the idea for GC Stop, the Guilford County solution to the opioid problem and the person who muscled it into place, Chase Holloman. I'm an adjunct professor here and 
Uh, I've worked with dozens of social work students and I also train uh, first responders, mostly emergency services, on how to engage someone that uses drugs. My name is Brian Kendrick. I graduated with a Master's of Social Work here at UNCG. My first year internship was with this gentleman right here at GC Stop, uh, Guilford County Solution to Opioid Problem. GC Stop is a program, it's a partnership between the county and UNC Greensboro. We have a suite of harm reduction services that we offer that range from post overdose response to our syringe services program to being a healthcare hub for people who use drugs, my justice involved program where we're able to go into the jails. We're just a resource for people who use drugs in the community. We're not authority figures, we're peers, we're colleagues. I've been where you are, I have the lived experiences. And the first thing we do is we work to destigmatize. Uh, we have to bust some myths that exist about people who use drugs and who they are and what they do. Along with busting myths, Chase, Brian, and the rest at GC Stop are out building bridges. Part of what makes the program so successful is community buy-in. One of the things we've learned a lot from our social work colleagues is how to talk to someone after an overdose, and often the when do you talk to someone after an overdose. That's Jim Albright. He heads up emergency medical services in Guilford County and works hand in hand with GC Stop. We're incredibly fortunate with the relationship that we've established. We saw it as an opportunity to work with our community uh, local university, but also the university's opportunity to work with the community. So it was Under Jim's leadership, Guilford County EMS has done an about face in how it handles overdose calls, establishing a post overdose response team. A post overdose response team is a, a rather novel concept that's come around just in the past few years. The team really provides the opportunity to approach a patient from different directions. And it's a result of, of first responders, typically emergency services, uh, responding to overdose. For years we just ran the call uh, and it was an episodic contact with a patient. I think what we've learned is that it's more than that. So what we do is we get referrals from emergency services and uh, they'll ask the person if they'd like to be reached out to by someone with lived experience. Um, if the person says, yeah, we'll go and visit that person, um, ask them how we can support them, get them naloxone, access to uh, supplies that can help increase their health. What we really need is folks that have lived experience, that have been where that person is. I've not. I've never overdosed. I've never had substance use issues. I really rely heavily on the collegial relationship that we've developed with the University of North Carolina at Greensboro and the program that we've developed in GC Stop. <laughs> Another big part of the program's success is a commitment from this man, Guilford County Sheriff Danny Rogers, who, by all accounts, means it when he says things like this. The young teenagers or uh, the young adults don't need a hammer, just need love on them. That's the message his deputies are hearing daily as Rogers hammers home the idea that law enforcement has changed, at least in his county. I like to believe that we're totally different than the, uh, the past history of law enforcement, arresting people and just telling them, like, you know, you know better, you knew better, so you get what you get. That's not what we do here at Gifford County Sheriff's Office. We make sure that when someone is down on their luck or they're traveling through an illness and they're dealing with addiction, we're not putting them down. What we're doing, we're trying to make sure that we can get them the help to be educated, try to get them to understand that it is hope, even though they feel hopeless at, the, at that time. We're applying different techniques, much better techniques. We're providing them with more resources, uh, more ways out, more ways to have a better quality of life. Therefore, we're saving families, uh, decreasing what we would have in the mental health, and also the mental health community, and also decreasing what we'd have in a criminal justice system. I love GC Stop because it exists at the crosshairs between, you know, like grassroots community folk and the state, you know, first responders, law enforcement, EMS, the university, um, things that historically haven't meshed well together. But you have to show people you care about them before you can show what you do for them. And that was some passion that I seen among GC Stop is they showed people they care about them before they show what they can do for them. And those people are willing to listen to them and they more to capture them in to let them know to what they're going to do for them. Yeah, you got to be a nice human being, man. Even if it's just leaving a bag with our name and number on it and say, call me when you're ready. Like, you know, that may be all you need to get that person to accept the fact that they need help 
and they want to enter treatment. When people look at me, uh, the first thing they say is when I tell them that I'm in recovery, the first thing I hear is, oh, you don't look like uh, that you used drugs before. And I said, well, what does people look like? To use drugs. So that's all. These days, Troy Manns heads up advocacy for Recovery Communities of North Carolina, RCNC, where he helps people understand stigma. My job is to really break those walls down and to teach people that addiction is not a moral deficiency, but it is a disease, and to help people understand that uh, people are not bad people. Uh, people have made some decisions over a period of time that has led them to this. Troy's authority on the subject comes from his own life experience. I'm from a mill town, the town called Eden, North Carolina. I worked a couple of mills, but my addiction was really just, you know, taking over my life. And uh, so I stumbled uh, into this work, uh, and, that, and I, I literally mean I stumbled into it. I, I had no plan to be an addiction counselor. I had no plan to work in recovery. I was in a halfway house at the time, and uh, the, the manager of the halfway house said, you know, if you're going to stay here, you need, to, you need to work, pay your rent. So a friend of mine said, hey, man, you know, Freedom House is hiring for uh, a health care technician. And I was like, well, man, I've never been, been to college to be a health care technician. <laughs> He was like, dude, you don't have to go to school for this. You'll just be driving uh, the clients to the meetings. And I was like, okay. And uh, I, I found something that gave me a purpose. I, I came from a place where people didn't understand it, man. They didn't, they didn't understand it. They was like, why don't you just stop? <laughs> you know, like, don't you see what this is doing to you? You know, and, and then, uh, you know, coming from a, a religious background, just go to church, you know, and things gonna get better, you know, and they're gonna lay hands on you and it's gonna be all right. And and really, uh, people didn't understand what was taking place. I'm a big believer in your pro you're a product of what you eat. You're a product of what you eat. America's public enemy number one so, in the United States is drug abuse. If you look back from uh, the Nixon administration and all the way through the Reagan administration with this war on drugs. Today, there's a new epidemic, smokable cocaine. And you look at what was being fed to people every day when they turn on the six o'clock news, it was, it was you saw people of color uh, being arrested, thrown on the pavement. So this has been ingrained into the American people's mind when you talk about addiction. And that's the stigma that we're fighting to this day. It would take years and new demographics before people's attitudes about substance use disorder would start to change. It started to be more of opioids. And then all of a sudden, when younger white kids begin to overdose, their parents start raising hell. They had somebody to advocate for them. And that's what started this movement. Most people that use drugs in my time, they didn't have people advocating for them. They, they didn't have anybody to go and advocate for the laws that were being made to incarcerate us for a long time. A lot of people, lives have been ruined because of policies that have been made towards people who are sick. That's something Margaret Bordeaux knows all too well. She's been working in harm reduction for decades, and on this day is helping out at the North Carolina Harm Reduction Office in Wilmington. This is just a safe place for folks to come to get the things that they need. Um, this is a judgment-free zone, stigma-free zone. Margaret works for the Department of Public Health's Injury and Violence Prevention Branch. She, too, helps people understand and overcome stigma. It's really about that uh, human side, right? Like, I could do this with my eyes closed. I could pass out syringes with my eyes closed. It's not hard. Um, some of the more difficult things I've done in this space and doing this work is really um, helping people forge a way, right? So linking them to care that they decided they needed, when they decided they needed, and they knew exactly how it looked, right? I sound radical by saying, like, people deserve compassion, love, and care. 
And there's nothing radical about that at all, right? But that's just where we are right now. So even that we have to question that, I think that's something we should all stand in and pay a bit more attention to. To the person, all the folks in this story will tell you harm reduction is a calling. I believe in my soul that it's what I was meant to do. Knowing that there was that much suffering going on and that people were living through similar situations that I had lived through, you know, it never felt right sort of like leaving people behind. They've taken on uh, a call, so to say, to say, you know what, I got a champion for this call. Everybody don't do that. It does the heart good to see a person get a basic need met, and I want to be a part of the collective that it helps people move forward. And that collective has been growing. The science around substance use disorder and society's understanding of it has been changing. And slowly, we are all becoming part of the solution. This is not for everybody. And there's not an expectation of everybody to do it. But there are lots of ways that everyone can help. See where you fit in there. But here's what we say. If you don't understand it, and you don't want to be a part of it, then just don't talk bad about it. The more you understand about the disease process, the more you understand what the cure can be. Naloxone distribution, that should be a no-brainer. It needs to be like on every wall that an AED is. Overdose deaths are preventable, and to give people access to that medication just seems like a baseline form of compassion and, and dignity. Think about what a life means to you. Think about what that means when somebody is alone and stops breathing, and then that life is over. Think about the weight of that. If you have someone that you love or care about that's you know, living through this, as hard as it is, just don't give up on them and, and just try to forgive them. You know, you, you never look at a person with diabetes and say, hey, that dude's a diabetic. You know, he, he, oh, that guy's a doctor. That guy's a father. That guy's a husband. Our goal with this is to let you see the whole person versus uh, the addicted person. We've had opportunities to see tremendous success. Folks that we may have run several overdoses on that we really felt like were on a trajectory that only was going to end in death. And we've seen those folks actually approach recovery, be successful, and return to the community as viable members of our society. At the end of the day, we got, we got, we're, we're a dysfunctional family as Americans. <laughs> we're really dysfunctional, you know. Everybody think they're right. But at the end of the day, if we put people first again, people, people first again, then we can, we can help shift this to another place of, of really being compassionate for others who, who may be different from us. And, and different is okay. Like, different is okay. We live and breathe harm reduction in everything that we do. I say harm reduction is my heart song. Um, it's why I get up in the morning. Um, it's why I stay awake at night. Harm reduction to me is life. It's keeping people alive and safe. Here's what you have to ask yourself. What does it benefit you for someone to lose their life when there's help available? For some reason, we believe the folks who are having the challenges, some way like they're deserving of that, right? We take care of chronic conditions every day, and it's not our job to judge the character of the person we're taking care of. It's our job to reduce mortality and morbidity in the state of North Carolina. A person doesn't have to die from an overdose. They can live another day. It's more than helping people survive, it's also helping people, you know, take charge um, over their own story, over their own lives, over their own recovery. We go through many different transitions of life. How do we face those transitions and challenges and still yet feel like we can accomplish our goals? 
I am incredibly grateful to be able to do the work that I'm doing. I never imagined that I would be able to do something like this. We have to make recovery, not treatment, but recovery part of our society. I think that we as humans, we just need to treat each other better. Not everybody's story is the same, but just come on and let's be part of the journey. Let's be family.